BookTube, and welcome back to Epic Wednesday. This is a comic book event that Michael K. Vaughn on his channel started in which he celebrates the epic collections of Marvel Comics, their big, generous, full-color reprint line of paperbacks, uh, and I sort of horned my way in. <laughs> and now we are a world's finest team where we are going through one epic collection a week and talking about the contents. And uh, this week, I'm letting, of course, Michael is doing the picking. He has far more of these things than I do. Uh, I have lots and lots of opinions on the subject, uh, but I don't have as many epic collections as he does. Uh, and today he's doing uh, The Return of Captain America, Captain America Lives Again, a big epic collection uh, that includes the whole of the beginning of the return of Captain America to Marvel continuity. Captain America for Timely Comics was a, a World War II era hero created by Joe Simon and Jack Kirby, but lots of those Captain America stories, including lots of prose stories, were written by Stan Lee. And the, some of those World War II era adventures of Captain America get really, really bizarrely creepy. <laughs> As you'll find out if you invest in the gigantic hardcover omnibus, the beautiful thing, uh, that Michael K. Vaughn held up on his video. I'll leave a link to his video down below. He held up uh, that classic you know, World War II era Captain America omnibus that includes all of those early appearances, some of them are have stuck in my mind as being really strange, really weird. There's one episode, one of those issues in which the Red Skull, Captain America's arch nemesis, captures him, chains him to a wall in the Red Skull's basement, and takes his place as Captain America in front of the public. And the storyline makes it clear that it goes on for a long time, weeks, maybe even months. <laughs> the Red Skull can't take off his Red Skull face, so he has to wear a disguise. But he has to take the costume off Captain America, right? In order to put it on himself? Or does he have a duplicate made? And even if he does have a duplicate made... He has to feed Captain America. He has to shave Captain America. He has to visit Captain America in that dungeon. All those days, day after day after day, he has to feed him. Give him a sippy cup of water. Oh, <laughs> anyway, uh, those things went away, and you know Joe Simon and Jack Kirby and Stan Lee went where they thought the market was. Westerns, true love stories, monster stories. And then uh, Stan Lee reinvented the, the superhero comic with, with Fantastic Four number one and got a lot of response. Lots of people loved what he was doing, so he started branching out immediately, just throwing a million superhero stories at the wall to see what would stick. Now, the one thing that delineates his genius, the one way that you can know that he was a genius, is how many of them stuck. <laughs> how many of them were not essentially bad ideas how many of them were really good ideas that he just needed to grow into. And quickly, by issue number four of the Avengers, he realized, I want to resurrect a lot of these characters that I worked on when I was 20 years younger. I want to resurrect them. Uh, and he did. He immediately started to do that. He did it with uh, Prince Namor the Submariner, but he also did it with Captain America. He brought Captain America back to the present day, having been in suspended animation where we learn in this in this new Tales from Tales of Suspense Captain America these new reboots we learned that he and his teenage sidekick Bucky were trying to stop a, a war plane a bomb plane of some kind that exploded Bucky was killed and Captain America was thrown into the ocean and went into suspended animation and eventually got frozen in a block of ice from which he was rescued by the Submariner, who in a fit of rage, not knowing that Captain America was in there, threw the block of ice into the ocean. The ocean warmed the ice, and the Avengers, by chance, in the hole of the ocean, happened to find Captain America's floating body. Bring it in, and he immediately revives. He immediately starts fighting. Right there in the cockpit of the submarine. Uh, when that happened, I pointed out to friends uh, at the time, the super soldier serum made Captain America the quintessence of, of the human body, uh, the, the epitome of, of human physical fitness. Uh, that doesn't mean you can't drown. It doesn't make you an amphibian, <laughs> you know? If, if, the, if you can have the super soldier serum all the way up to your eyeballs, if you, are, if you are face down unconscious in water for more than a few seconds, you're gonna drown. <laughs> you're, gonna, you're just gonna die. If you're encased in a block of ice for more than a few seconds, you're gonna suffocate. 
whether you have a super serum or not, you're, you're going to suffocate. It would, it, there are a lot of ways to do this particular thing, but it, that, that wasn't one of them, and nevertheless, that was the story. And as Michael K. Vaughn points out in his own video today, that was kind of the thrill for Stan Lee. That was kind of the short-term thrill. Bring Captain America back. What would it be, wouldn't it be great if Captain America were back and maybe joined the Avengers? Michael K. Vaughn is entirely right in saying that Captain America is the perfect Avenger. He's, he, he's no coincidence he became sort of symbolic of the team. Uh, but Stan Lee didn't think beyond that. What do you do beyond that? Steve Rogers' friends would either be very old or dead. His life, as he knew it, would be gone. Who is he, then? What do you do with this? That might not have been a big deal if resp fan response had been tepid to moderate, as it was with, for instance, The Vision. But fans went crazy about Captain Ray. They were, they were overjoyed to have him back and wanted him to have a feature of his own. Well, that presents a problem, narratively speaking. What do you do with this character if you're going to give him a feature of his own? Who is he? What is he? He isn't effectively Steve Rogers from New York anymore. Because that life is gone. He doesn't have the kind of uh, sanctified mission that all the World War II heroes had because Hitler is gone. The Nazis were defeated. The war, the war is over. It presented Stan Lee with a problem. And uh, these issues, the issues in this epic collection, are his tentative attempts at solving that problem. What would you do if you were writing Captain America? Michael K. Vaughn is entirely right that other writers did a better job of tackling that, but Stanley teamed up with Jack Kirby, and all of a sudden they were writing and drawing Captain America again for a totally new generation. A generation of readers who had never encountered those old Captain America comics unless they raided the, the old war chest up in the attic that belonged to their dads or their grandfathers. Uh, and I can't show you that epic collection. Or rather, yes, I can show you that epic collection, uh, the cover of it. Here, I think I have the cover of it. Uh, yes, I do. Isn't technology wonderful? This is the epic collection that we're talking about. Captain America Lives Again. And this is a big, generous epic collection that takes into account Avengers number four, it takes into account all those tales of suspense where Captain America was sharing billing with Iron Man. So one half of the issue was a Lee Kirby extravaganza of, of Captain America until Kirby went elsewhere and we get other artists, including George Tuska, who's workmanlike, probably was very nice, never did any really good work. We also got Gil Kane, but unfortunately in the issues where Gil Kane is in this volume, he inks himself. And that's not, a, that some artists, sure. Gil Kane, no. No, he should not ink himself. Uh, some inkers will, will have styles that clash with his and will ruin it, but other inkers won't. Other inkers won't. Better to find an inker that works with him than to have him ink himself. But one way or another, uh, it's great to see him do. And uh, I believe this volume extends far enough that, of course, the names on the cover are Lee and Kirby. But I think this, this volume extends far enough so that uh, Gene Cullen is also involved in the artwork for a couple of issues. Maybe not. Maybe he's a little too early. But one way or another, I know what all of you are thinking. You're seeing this and you're thinking, all right, so when do the fireworks start? You and Michael K. Vaughn never agree anymore. You're going to fight about this. But no, no, we're not. Sorry. So, sorry to disappoint. Uh, even Michael K. Vaughn in his video rather vocally expects that I will that I will hate this, that I will mock it from start to finish. I don't at all. Captain America's origin story is pretty, is pretty nuts and bolts solid. It's bioengineering. We have lived into the era that makes that origin story seem even more solid than usual. This is one of the few instances where I would say the Marvel Cinematic Universe version of the early Captain America origin story and early Mar Captain America world is incredibly good. If you watch the first Captain America movie starring my homeboy, Chris Evans, you will see a, a version that is either true to the Captain America origin story that's elaborated on in this epic collection or improves on it. That's terrific. <laughs> there are all sorts of little details in that movie that really, really work. They, they really, really work. And you won't notice them at first, maybe. Like that Steve Rogers, when the first thing he does is chase down the, the Hydra operative that kills the scientist who is the benefactor, the scientist who made him into, a, into Captain America. The first thing he does tries, is try to chase down that villain in the movie. One man on foot, barefoot, chasing a car. That's supposed to give us an idea of how improved a human being Captain America is. But in that scene, Captain America, Steve Rogers, 
isn't accustomed to the new power of his muscles and actually loses control of himself and falls through a, a storefront window has to just get up and get going again but that that's neat that he doesn't have the you know the full situational awareness of having 200 extra pounds of muscle on his on his skeleton uh, but one way or another uh, that adaptation of the movie a lot of you will have seen that movie and that adaptation not only does it have the best final scene of any Marvel Cinematic Universe movie but it also uh, avoids a lot of the awkwardness involved in having Captain America come back alive in what is relatively so short a time period after he would have been gone. These Captain America adventures are taking place in the 60s and Captain America was publishing in the 40s. So yeah, you're a lot of the people that you know would either be dead or older, but it, the whole world wouldn't have changed. You, the gap has to be longer. The more, the longer that gap is, the more effective it is. Uh, especially once you take into account uh, one of the ways that Stanley decided to try to make Captain America that horrible word relatable in his new incarnation was to have him forever grief stricken by the loss of Bucky, his teenage sidekick. To the point where he hallucinates at one point that Rick Jones, the teenage sidekick of the Avengers, thank God the teenage sidekicks seem to have gone away, but it, at one point he hallucinates that Rick Jones is a dead ringer for Bucky and that maybe, maybe sort of, kind of, <sighs> one way or another. For a long time in Marvel Comics there was a standard line, nobody dies but Bucky and maybe Uncle Ben <laughs> from Spider-Man. Maybe that, but in superheroes nobody dies but Bucky. And uh, the reason why that became a kind of truism in Marvel Comics is because it rapidly became obvious that no one else had died in World War II. Not Hitler, he becomes the hate monger. Not the Human Torch, certainly not the Submariner, not any of the B-list heroes. They all live. <laughs> They're all alive. They all have legacies leading forward into the modern Marvel Age of Comics. Uh, and then, of course, that maxim was thrown down and danced upon because Bucky lives. Bucky is the Winter Soldier. So now nobody in Marvel Comics. Uncle Ben alone. He's the only one who's still dead and who will probably forever stay dead. But if you were a superhero, he'd be back. No doubt about it. Uh, and in these early issues, Stan Lee has to figure out what to do with Captain America. He's a man out of time. Okay, I can work with that. He's grieving for his partner who, in his, in his mind, died just a minute ago. Okay, I can work with that as well. But other than that, who is he? Right? Does he have a civilian life? Does he have any of the, does he have a romance? Does he have any of the grist that Stan Lee usually used to make a character? And here you see him fumbling around, but what glorious fumbling it is. Oh my, what glorious fumbling it is. And a large part of that has to do with the artwork. This is great Jack Kirby artwork. This is Jack Kirby deciding or being allowed to draw things in a way that suits his own talents as opposed to in a way that most efficiently tells a storyboarded idea that he was handed by somebody else. Jack Kirby is a master of breathing a panel, of letting a panel breathe. So it'll be fast, paced for a while, and then it will pause, or then it will take in a deep breath with a big panel, and then it will move on. And he gets better at it as he goes along, but the, these Captain America issues are fantastic for that. They're fantastic for the artwork. The re, you think, you're, you're, I know what you're thinking. You're thinking, okay, well, you agree with Michael K. Vaughn in this case, you really like these issues, most of them. I mean, some of them are by second-rate talents, but the, the Lee Kirby collaborations in this volume, rightly signaled on the cover, are fantastic. They are fantastic. And you might be thinking, well, okay, if you, if you think that they're fantastic, then why don't you have this epic volume? Why don't you have this collection? Why are you showing us only a cover? I'll show you the reason. Marvel has another, uh, in addition to that big omnibus, uh, that Michael K. Vaughn showed that I'm sure I'm sure there's an omnibus of the Lee Kirby years as well. I'm sure that in other words that it's stately Vaughn Manor. Michael K. Vaughn has these issues in several different places. I'm sure that he does. Uh, but in addition to those big omnibus volumes, Marvel also has a regular reprint line that is still ongoing called the Marvel Masterworks volumes. Hardcover volumes, egregiously overpriced, eighty dollars I think. That they, they do I think one every week, certainly one every month. And those are different from the epic collections because they're not bouncing around chronologically. This Captain America Lives Again volume was not the first volume of epic collection that Captain America got. 
it, it, with the Epic Collection, you get to bounce around from run to run, from storyline to storyline. The Marvel Masterworks volumes are just plodding straight along in strict chronological order. I love them. I have quite a few of them. I've had quite a few of them over the years, despite the eye-watering expense. And for a while, Marvel also produced the Marvel Masterworks volumes in paperback. They would do a hardcover, and then a couple of years later, they'd come out with a paperback. They'd split the volume up into two and come out with paperbacks. And the paperbacks, for a while, were noteworthy because the artwork on the cover was touched up, recolored, reformatted, cleaned up, uh, which made it collectible in its own right. And they did that with Captain America, and that's what I want to show you. Look at this. That is Marvel Masterworks paperback, Captain America, Volume 1. They took a classic Jack Kirby cover and touched it up. They redid it, recolored, uh, blurred the outlines, sharpened the the, the, the uh, color contrast on the leotards, on the chain mail and whatnot. They gave it essentially a new cover. That's cat, catnip to collectors. You know the collectors are going to get this even if they know that the internal contents are exactly the same. And they are in this case. They're exactly the same. But Marvel made two of them. Captain America Marvel Masterworks Volumes 1 and 2. These two together are the epic collection that Michael K. Vaughn holds up in his video. Same issues. Uh, uh, same, uh, you, you get the, the great origin story of the Red Skull. Uh, you get a whole bunch of flashback adventures to the uh, to Captain America's World War II adventures. Look at this panel. Here's, here's the story where we get the full dress canonical origin story of Captain America. I want to show you, the see, there he is, he, he becomes a perfect, he goes from a 4F specimen to a perfect model human being right before the, the scientist is assassinated. Uh, and I want to show you, look at this panel. Lee tells Kirby, okay, we need a montage to show Captain America's meteoric appearance into the public view uh, for the first time ever. This is not Captain America's reappearance, this is the appearance of a red, white, and blue bombshell into the world. Keep in mind, this is another thing that the movie does right. If you're going to have a character who's dressed in red, white, and blue, you're probably going to employ him to sell war bonds. You're probably not going to make him any kind of government operative. He's probably not going to stand behind him that way. In the comics, he is, right from the beginning. And look at the panel that Kirby gives Lee for that montage. Just look at that. Unbelievable. You have headlines in the background. You have these incredible motion panels that Kirby does better than anybody. Just amazing. That is the montage that shows Captain America bursting onto the public view. Uh, this is the first volume, the one half of the epic collection that Michael K. Vaughn shows, and this is the second one, which ought to answer my question about, uh, oh no, you're finishing up with Jack Kirby artwork, but in the meantime, you have had George Tusca, you've had Gil Kane, uh, and you've also had one, yeah, there's Gil Kane. <laughs> you've also had one of my favorite moments in the Lee Kirby realization of Captain America. And I think it's in this second volume. I want to show it to you. Uh, Captain America falls prey to a villain called the Adaptoid. Uh, a weird android-type creature that, that surprises him, captures him, ties him up in a broom closet, and takes on his shape and form and abilities in order to infiltrate the Avengers and bring down S.H.I.E.L.D., Hail Hydra. <laughs> and the, the Adaptoid has no sooner adapted to Captain America's form than someone bursts through the window of Avengers Mansion. Uh, even the mighty, even the stronghold of the mighty Avengers cannot prevent the Tumblr's entry. The, the, the villain is the Tumblr. There is the Adaptoid saying, what the? <laughs> Guy just threw himself through the window of Avengers Mansion. I'm pretty sure that Avengers Mansion should be able to keep out a random acrobat, <laughs> but one way or another. The tumbler somersaults into position and very vigorously, repeatedly tells Captain America that once I have defeated you, I will rule the criminal underworld. I will be the mightiest of them all. And we get his backstory. He's just a stumble bum trying to infiltrate a gang. They throw him out because he's nobody. He learns to become somebody. He learns to lift weights, dodge flying pins, be an acrobat. He says... Uh, there's one thing that he says, Captain America, why can't I do that? He doesn't have any special powers. He's just an ordinary Joe like me. There's just one thing he's got better than anybody, and that's training. And so he trains uh, to become the tumbler in order to, uh, to become the leader of the underworld. <laughs> I had a chuckle about this. I reread this for today and chuckled about it again because 
I'm, I'm trying to take bets here on just how many seconds the tumbler would last if he burst into the office of the kingpin and said, all right, I took out Captain America. Now I'm going to take out you and rule you. <laughs> just imagine it. Can you just imagine it? <laughs> kingpin weighs 400 pounds, solid muscle. The tumbler bounces all around him, smashes into him left, right, and center. <laughs> the kingpin slaps him, and that's it. That's all it's over with. But the, the adaptoid is sure that if he defeated Captain America, he can defeat the tumbler, this jerkoid, the tumbler in his, in his pink leotard. Uh... What does he have? That I, but it, it turns out to be hard. The tumbler is, is largely winning. And the, the adaptoid is saying, why? What am I lacking? Why am I unable to stop him? Uh, and the tumbler keeps saying, I've proven that I can outmaneuver you with ease. Now all that remains is to demonstrate that my fighting strength is also far greater than yours. And the adaptoid is saying, no, I did my task without error. I adapted perfectly. You can't. Uh, <laughs> uh, the fight, look at that. Look at the compositions here. This is nothing like the, the early crappy Fantastic Four that we were seeing. That is just fantastic. Just just amazing. Uh, the Tumbler smashes Captain America through a wall. Th just smashes him into a closet. Says, I've had enough of you. I don't even need to worry about you anymore. You were, I was easy, able to beat you easily. But while he's doing that, the real Captain America is... Uh, getting out of his bonds, and the tumbler doesn't know that. So he throws the fake Captain America into a closet. What does he say? What is the Stan Lee histrionic? You're washed up, and you know it. Therefore, I've no further interest in you. You can remain in here to live in, with memories of your past, because for you, there can be no more future. The tumbler has ended the career of Captain America forever. Uh, and then he stands in front of the closet. Gloating some more. <laughs> this guy is, as uh, what used to call it, cruising for a bruising. If you think you still have a chance, come out again. I'm waiting for you. The tumbler fears no one that lives. I can defeat anyone. I'm a dozen times the fighter Captain America ever was. <laughs> and a Captain America does come bursting out of the closet and clocks him. Uh, and the tumbler immediately notices the difference. Where did he get a punch like that? I don't get it. I tossed a beaten cabbage in there and out pops a fighting mad tiger. But I beat him once, I'll do it again. See, he's on the ground. He figures, I'll beat him once and I'll do it again. So he hurls his shield and Captain America catches it easily. No trouble at all. Uh, you caught it like it was nothing more than a toss from shortstop to first. And he says, oh, and Captain America says, shucks, that's the dullest part. It's tossing it around and bouncing it from wall to wall. That's the most fun. And the tumbler is completely overwhelmed completely overwhelmed he uh, he says what changed him what made him fight like the captain america of old he he leaps behind the table captain america smashes him against the wall the tumbler says ah you did just what i wanted i'm using the table now as a weapon look at the look at the action here look at how wonderful it is of course captain america is waiting for him pins him down and then slugs him and the tumbler is just standing there you can't beat me this easily. You can't. Not after all my training, all my planning. I was set to be the kingpin of the world, of the underworld, after I'd beaten you. Captain America says, but it would put you in a higher tax bracket. Think of what you have to pay. And then easily defeats him. Just easily defeats him. And uh, I love that exchange. I love that moment. I, there are a lot of great moments like that in these early Lee and Kirby Captain America. I love that moment because that moment occurs often. There's another moment like that. Sooner or later, if I wait long enough, I'm sure that Michael K. Vaughn will get to Thor when it comes to Marvel Comics. But there's a great moment uh, in, in an early Thor comic, also Lee and Kirby, where he fights someone called the Absorbing Man, who can absorb the properties of anything that he touches, including Thor, including Thor's hammer. And he figures, well, if I have that power, I'm unbeatable. And then he starts fighting Thor, and everything that you see in this, in this uh, volume comes into play. Skill. The whole, seeing the whole of the combat world, experience, all that sort of stuff comes in. And the, the Absorbing Man is in the, overwhelmed in the exact same way as the Tumblr, where he says, I don't understand, it's like fighting a whirlwind, why can't I beat you? Uh, so that's a wonderful moment. Sooner or later we'll get to it once Michael K. Vaughn is done talking about all these loser heroes. <laughs> but one way, one way or another, uh, this... Captain America run is terrific, and I don't have the Epic Collection because I have these old Marvel Masterworks volumes. I am not, I have not reached the Michael K. Vaughn point of continuously buying repeats of comics until I have ten different editions of the same thing. 
Uh, but there's a point that I want to make about Captain America before I before I uh, sign off. I mentioned that when he revives in the present day, he doesn't know who he is. We don't, we don't. Stan Lee doesn't know what to do with this character. It's not like he has a, a supporting cast, which was Stan Lee's bread and butter. His supporting cast is all gone, except Nick Fury, who was in World War II and is still mysteriously unaged. So they, Captain America and Nick Fury get to know each other. Captain America becomes a sort of unofficial member of Shield. Uh, but in terms of friendship or romance, they, they, this Captain America is cut adrift. And the old Captain America, what he was during World War II, he had that whole world, friends, comrades, politicians, loved ones, but he was also a symbol of something bigger. He was a pure symbol of something bigger. The Captain America part of him was a symbol of America's defiance in World War II. And when you transpose Captain America into the modern day, Stan Lee immediately, and lots of readers immediately felt, oh, okay, what do we do now? You've got to give him some sort of relevance. You've got to later on, we'll make him fall out of favor with the government because of Watergate, because of Nixon. You'll have him wonder if maybe he should be a police officer. Maybe later on he should be an artist. Maybe he should revive an um, interest that he had when he was a kid before he became Captain America, etc., etc., etc. And the reason why you have that fumbling around is because of the difference between Marvel and my beloved DC Comics. All of the heroes in my beloved era of DC Comics are that disembodied Captain America. All of them are already just disembodied, pure symbols. And there's nothing wrong with that. You don't need them to have Freudian psychoanalysis on every other page. They just are that. And that is why Captain America has always sat so oddly with, with Marvel Comics. He is a symbol of Marvel Comics. He is a quintessential symbol of the Avengers. But it, writers almost always don't know what quite to do with him. What do you do with him when he's got his costume on? There would be no problem with this kind of Captain America if he were in DC. There would be no problem at all. All of DC's canonical heroes were like that until Marvel fanboys got their grubby hands on them. <laughs> so I just wanted to point that out. That, that it's when Captain America is at his most disembodied, his most symbolic, that he's at his most recognizable to me <laughs> as a superhero. I'm, I'm, I'm the one who's impatiently toe-tapping while he goes through one existential crisis after another. <laughs> but anyway, I, I will show you the, uh, the the Epic Collection one more time, because there's no reason for you to go out and buy these paperback Marvel Mask Works. I should ask Michael. I'm not sure. I don't think Marvel makes paperback Marvel Mask Works anymore. Maybe they do. Maybe they figure there are rubes out there who will buy these things even when they're making Epic Collections of the same thing. But... I don't think I've seen one in a long time. I don't think I've seen one offered in a comic book store in a long time. I think Epic Collections sort of took their place. Uh, but this is our Epic Collection for today. Captain America lives again. The relaunching of a World War II hero into the modern era. A far better relaunching than the Submariner God from Stan Lee and Jack Kirby at the exact same time. Captain America got a better relaunching and eventually had many, many great runs on his own title, so we'll be getting to those. I'm sure the Epic Collection, I think there are five Captain America Epic Collections, and Michael K. Vaughn must have them all. But we won't be getting to them next time. New nope. next time, it's Iron Man. I wondered how long we would go <laughs> after the Hulk, uh, but it, it, it would be a little bit of punishment for me to revisit those issues in this upcoming week, but it'll certainly be catnip for the rest of you. Because you like to see me and Michael fight. <laughs> You're going to get a little of that next week. <laughs> but in the meantime, I recommend this this epic collection. It's a ter despite the, the B-list right artists who come in for a couple of issues, it's it's totally a recommend. Uh, so I'm going to wrap up Comic Book Wednesday, and I will see you next week. <laughs> Thank you, Book 2.